Okay, good evening and welcome to today's discussion. My name is Bernd Rother. I'm from Berlin. I'm a senior research fellow with the Willy Brandt Foundation. And tonight we will hear two talks on the political opposition in the GDR in Poland, Solidarność and political opposition before the fall of the wall. This event is part of the EU sponsored project from Helsinki to Berlin, Europe and the end of the Cold War. Main organizer is the Lisbon University Institute's Center of International Studies, headed by Professor Luis Rodriguez. Before presenting today's or tonight's speakers, let me say some words about the project. Traditional Cold War narratives tend to place the United States and the Soviet Union at the center of the action and to assume that Europe was a relatively passive actor in the course of the advance, events. This project emphasizes the role of European actors in the final years of the Cold War and in the developments that culminated in the fall of the Berlin Wall. In this sense, it traces the origins of this role from the Helsinki summit in 1975 to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 from, Ber from Helsinki to Berlin, emphasizing the European actors such as, such as the European economic uh, community, political leaders, NGOs, and youth and students activist groups in promoting political contacts, cultural, cultural exchanges, and the dissemination of values such as freedom, democracy, and human rights between the two sides of the Berlin Wall. Tonight, we have two speakers, which come from the Netherlands and from Belgium. Christy Medema is an historian connected as postdoctoral research fellow to the Institute of German Studies at the University of Amsterdam. In 2015, she defended and published her PhD dissertation on responses of West German and Dutch left-wing organizations to the opposition movements movement in Poland in the 1980s. Her areas of interest include human rights, international solidarity and dialogue, migration and labor rights. In 2019, she published her second book, Not a Movement of Dissidents, about Amnesty International's dealings with attempts to replicate its activists in Poland and the Soviet Union. She now works as campaign and outreach coordinator at Clean Clothes Campaign and is involved with Amnesty Netherlands as regional coordinator for Central and Eastern Europe. Edis Barald Gordieris is a Slavist and a historian. He teaches courses on colonial history, history of Poland, and history of India. His research mainly focuses on the relationship of our society with other cultures and political regimes. He particularly examines this by means of the history of migration, European identities, transnational social movements, East, West and North, South contexts, communist secret services during the Cold War, development aid and post-colonial memories. He's a senior member of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, where he coordinates the Leuven India Focus. And directly, Edith Bart, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Bernd. Uh, thank you also um, to the organizers. I presume that you hear me. Okay, yeah. So, um, indeed, um, as Ben said, I um, would be talking for about um, uh, 20 minutes, uh, and I would like to discuss uh, the Western societal and then especially the Western trade union support for um, Solidarność. Um, the Polish crisis of the early 1980s, and this includes the strikes of August 1980, the creation of the independent self-governing trade union Solidarity, Solidarność, in the subsequent month, September 1980, then the 500 days of freedom, and uh, uh, eventually the proclamation of martial law in December 1981 and the banning of Solidarność. So all of this 
called the Polish crisis of the early 1980s. This caused a great deal of social reaction in the West. Both newly founded organizations and all social movements tried to help the new and independent Polish trade union. They informed the broader public on the situation in Poland, visited and hosted Polish unionists, and collected money for humanitarian, financial or political aid. After the proclamation of martial law, this support went on with demonstrations being held, petitions being signed and political statements being issued. Fundraising and relief continued during the rest of the 1980s. Various forms of aid, from food to printing machines, were channeled or smuggled into Poland. This social reaction has so far mainly been analyzed from a national perspective. Initially, especially countries that had put themselves in the picture by giving a great deal of publicity to their activity, have raised scholars' interest. For instance, the United States and France. This caused reaction in some other countries. German historians, for instance, revealed that the juxtaposition between a supportive France and a reluctant Germany, of course I'm talking about West Germany, does not match with the historical reality. Swedish and Danish colleagues went along the same line. And today I'll try to discuss this in greater detail. I'll argue that solidarity with Solidarność was not inspired by a greater or smaller sympathy with Poland, but colored by national particularities. I focus on trade unions, which often were in the hub of solidarity campaigns, Solidarność also being a trade union. Let's first have a look at France. France has often been put into the spotlight as the Western European country which identified most with Solidarność. From the summer of 1980 onwards, all major French trade union confederations, including the communist CGT, expressed their support with Solidarność. On December 14, 1981, so one day after the proclamation of martial law, this news brought between 50,000 and 100,000 people onto the streets of Paris. A demonstration remembered as one of the largest since World War II. Over the following months, French trade unions collected more than 8 million French francs, or $1 million, a sum that was called the highest amount for Solidarność ever accumulated. Over the following years, this support continued. Special organizations set up particular actions. Solidarité France-Pologne, for instance, started a parrainage campaign in which French and Polish families were put in contact, sorry, were put in contact with each other in order to give very concrete and direct support. French regional trade unions, for their part, concluded cooperation agreements with local branches of Solidarność. By the end of 1985, there were already more than 10 of these so-called jumelage or twin agreements. Of course, the enthusiasm gradually decreased, but nevertheless, the French trade unions were always considered to be the most sympathetic of Solidarność. Especially the CFDT, was perceived as Solidarność's greatest ally in the West, next to the American AFL-CIO. As I said in my introduction, German, Germany, Germany, so German reaction was different and has often been represented as the opposite of the French response. For example, 
Helena Sjursen explicitly states in her monograph that in contrast, I quote, in contrast to France, the imposition of martial law in Poland did not produce much of a public response in West Germany, unquote. The German Trade Union Confederation, DGB, indeed kept contact with official Polish trade unions and was less involved in the organization of demonstrations. The ICFTU's International Action Day on 30 January 1982, for instance, having much less res resonance in the FRJ than in France. However, there is little basis for this perceived contrast. Recent research reveals that German aid, as a matter of fact, outnumbered that of France. According to some estimates, it even exceeded the amount of 1 billion USD. This was neglected at the time and has since slipped into oblivion. On the one hand, the DGB, so the German trade union, was criticized and its name blackened inter alia by the French media and the Polish authorities who made use of all stereotypes to discredit the German unionists. Even Solidarność adopted a lower profile towards the DGB since it was aware of the problematic relationship between Germany and Poland. Last but not least, the DGB itself acted very discreetly transferring responsibility and donating funds to other organizations. Taking the sensible situation into account, it did not want to jeopardize Solidarność's position. The DGB was not the only trade union confederation that preferred to take a lower profile. Swedish and the Danish LO, so Landesunion, also a trade union, did more or less the same. Sweden played a crucial role in channeling aid to Poland, profiting from its geographical location and the visa-free status between the countries. 50 trucks headed off from the country to Poland in 1982 and 1983. However, the LO deliberately organized this relief in a very discreet way in order to prevent Solidarność from being compromised by foreign aid. The LO even came into conflict on this issue with the International Trade Union Confederation ICFTU. The latter made more publicity around Solidarność and afterwards gained a wider reputation for being an ardent supporter of the Polish opposition. The Danish LO is reputed for having sent only one tool to the polls, a recipe for printing ink. Yet, this does not mean that it should be accused of failure to help Solidarność. On the contrary, it supported the Polish dissident movement in a political and multilateral way. It backed the fundraising of humanitarian organizations and, even more significantly, channeled aid via the ICFTU instead of directly to Poland. According to a Danish trade unionist, the Nordic country, countries contributed one third of the ICFTU's international solidarity funds income throughout the 1980s while they only represented 7% of the ICFTU membership. By the way, I forgot to mention, but the ICFTU is the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, so the, the Social Democratic Trade Unions. And I'm presenting uh, the relations with the uh, DGB, Swedish and Danish LO on the one hand, and the ICFTU, so the International um, um, Umbrella Organization on the other. It is impossible to give correct figures or a total overview, but the Danish LO donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the ICFTU, both on a regular annual basis and following demands for additional funding. 
não nos consegue. What is more? What is more? This was the first time ever that the LO had financially assisted an international solidarity committee. And at the same time had such open conflict on a foreign issue with its political ally, the Social Democratic Party. Even if Danish aid might seem limited from an international perspective, the Polish crisis was, was a milestone within the Danish framework. There were still other countries where trade unions reacted neither in an enthusiastic way nor in a discreet one. The Austrian trade union, ÖGB, for instance, was reluctant. Its president allegedly even went so far as to refer to Vavenza, Solidarność leader, as a criminal during an official meeting with Honecker in Eastern Germany in 1983. His political associate, the Austrian Social Democratic Chancellor Bruno Kreisky, asked Polish workers to stop striking and to continue producing coal. The Austrian tabloid press used an anti-Polish and xenophobic discourse while covering the refugee wave in 1981. Of course, this is not to say that the whole Austri Austrian society was against Solidarność. On the contrary, assistance was provided by the church, by the People's Party, Christian Democratic, by parts of the Social Democratic government and party, and also by unionists. Christian trade unions within the ÖGB transferred many financial resources to Poland from 1980 onwards. Yet, there was also reluctance. And it does not seem a coincidence that precisely the Austrian ÖGB was the first trade, Western trade union to make contact with the official, also communist, Polish trade union OPZZ when its president invited a Polish delegation to Vienna in the autumn of 1986. All of these examples, France, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, and Austria, all of these examples show that reaction differed. Other cases would only confirm this. In some countries, there was united solidarity, for instance, in Italy, where the three trade union confederations, the Christian Democratic CISL, the Social Democratic UL, and even the communist CJEL created a joint front. In other countries, support was less unanimous. In Belgium, the Christian Democratic trade union ACVCSC identified with Solidarność, while its social democratic counterpart, the ABVVFGTB, was not against Solidarność, but sympathized especially where co with conflicts where the left was repressed, such as the dictator dictatorial tyranny in Chile and Ar Argentina, the apartheid regime in South Africa, and the cases of US interventionism in Central America. In other countries, still, things developed over time. The British TUC is reputed to have been one of the last Western European trade unions to recognize Solidarność, but later supported the independent Polish Union, providing Solidarność with financial aid, both before and after the proclamation of martial law, and sending 13 lorries of humanitarian relief to Poland between December 1981 and September 1983. Reaction differed not only between countries, but also within ideologies. It is obvious that Christian trade unions especially sympathized with the independent Polish trade union. These included the CFTC in France, the CISL in Italy, the ACVCSC in Belgium, and the tiny Christian social faction within the United Austrian Confederation, UGB. This Christian support seems logical. Solidarność, 
a trade union developing into a mass movement, working together with the church and defending the interests of workers in a contested socialist society, confirmed the Christian democratic trade union movement's reason for existence. Still, there were differences between those Christian trade unions. While the Belgian ACV CSC put the involvement of the church into the spotlight, celebrating masses and blessing a convoy of trucks leaving from, for Poland, the Italian Chisel stressed human dignity and autonomy more than church issues in order to remain on the same line with the social democratic will and the communist sigil. In Spain, where Catholicism was associated with the Franco regime, it was not the Catholic organizations that took the lead in supporting Solidarność, but Uso, which had been in the underground under Franco and identified itself with anti-totalitarian struggle rather than with Catholicism. All in all, it is clear that reaction to Solidarność was very different. Even within adherence of one ideology, some put the independent trade union high on the agenda and others showed reluctance. These attitudes were determined by a variety of reasons, but it is striking that chiefly national particularities accounted for solidarity with Solidarność. First of all, it is clear that trade unions supported Solidarność when they had an interest in doing so, namely when Solidarność could strengthen their own program. The Polish crisis seems to have been a bigger or more public issue in countries without a single unified trade union confederation. Belgium counted two trade union confederations, Christian Democratic and Social Democratic, Italy three, France six, and Spain even more. In all of these countries, some confederations more explicitly identified with Solidarność in order to distinguish themselves from other trade unions. Along with this, trade union confederations that had faced split and exodus were especially fascinated by Solidarność. In Spain, the Uso had suffered a major division in 1977 when a large number of its members had left for the Social Democratic UGT. In France, the CFDT had hastened its reor reorientation after the collapse of the Union of the Left in 1977 and the right's electoral victory in 1978. Still in the 1980s, there was almost daily discussion on numerous issues with the communist CGT. Both the Uso in Spain and the CFDT in France hoped that mobilization for Solidarność could breathe new life into their own organizations. Conversely, reaction was much less vocal in countries with only one dominating trade union confederation, such as, such as Germany, Austria, Great Britain, Denmark, and Sweden, the United States being an obvious exception. All of these unions remained in the background and did not side too openly with Solidarność. Many of them had also, though to a more limited extent, contact with the official trade unions in Poland and other communist countries. Of course, restraint should not be overstated, particular groups placing vital importance on Solidarność. Still, this solidarity with Solidarność differed from that in countries such as France, Belgium or Italy. It was less vociferous and emotional and more hesitant and pragmatic. Another element accounting for this reluctance is the concern about détente and peace. 
According to the more discreet trade unionists, too much publicity would alarm communist authorities, threaten detente, and thus harm Solidarność. They therefore wanted to avoid Solidarność being given the label of an organization that was backed by or even dependent on the Western enemy. They did not want to intervene in domestic affairs. Denouncing Solidarność if it was too revolutionary and praising it if it recognized the communist monopoly on political power. They preferred to deal with trade union issues only and did not wish to become involved in politics. They criticized other, more vocal Western trade unions for pouring oil on the flames or for using the Polish crisis to strengthen their own political program. They were afraid that interference and polarization would lead to confrontation and a new application of the Brezhnev doctrine. This belief in detente was a much more important element in understanding reluctance or reserve than ideological factors such as communist sympathies or anti-Catholicism. Some of these united unions indeed counted a considerable number of communists among their members and therefore could not side with the Solidarność without any nuance. However, this cannot be generalized some united trade unions, such, a, such as the Danish LO, for instance, being even very anti-communist. The same goes for criticism of Catholicism. It is obvious that many trade unionists were confused by the numerous mass celebrations, the portraits of the Pope, and the crosses they saw on Polish demonstrations and strikes. However, Anti-Catholicism was relative. The same British critics of Catholic Solidarność supported the cause of Catholic nationalism in Northern Ireland. One can assume that Klaus Misgel's conclusion on Sweden applies to the rest of Western Europe. There was suspicion inside the Swedish LO on the grounds of Catholicism, but, I quote, there is no evidence that the reservation was significant or that it prevented the LO from supporting Solidarność. There were still other factors coloring a particular nation's and trade union's reaction to Solidarność. These were very diverse, ranging from the traditional relationship with Poland and the social dealing with communism to the presence of Polish immigrants all in all, it is even striking to what a large extent the interpretation of and reaction to Solidarność was determined by domestic issues. I leave it at here, but I'm looking forward um, to the debate or to questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Edith Bald, for your um, uh, very interesting overview on the Western European reactions, especially the trade union reactions so uh, technical advice uh, you are all uh, you all can now ask questions directly to Edith Bart uh, after the second speaker after Christy we have the same procedure direct questions to her talk and then we have a general discussion uh, you can uh, raise your hand uh, to show me that you want to ask a question the problem is that even with the gallery view uh, I don't see you all at once this is a positive sign we are so many but uh, it would be better for me to have a question in the chat. And Margot Jata has uh, well, had a question, but they were answered during his speech. <laughs> speech. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so I, I looked at the chat, uh, don't see any hands. So uh, I have a first question uh, for you, Edith Bald. Uh, you stress the importance of detente, the positioning towards detente as a um, not dividing, but structuring line uh, with regard to solidarity, intensity of solidarity with Solidarność. Um, 
In, at the same time, in 1980, 81, 82, uh, in West Europe, there was uh, as, as, at least as important as the solidarity, the Polish question, the question of the Euro missiles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is this the same dividing or structuring line uh, which uh, groups uh, those who were vocally and strongly uh, helping solidarity, Solidarność? And the same line goes, splits uh, those who were uh, vocally against Euro missiles and others uh, more quietly, or are these uh, different blocks? Yeah, uh, Ben, thank you very much. It's a very good question. And I must admit that I'm not a specialist of um, the Western European um, attitudes towards the Euro missile crisis. So the differences um, uh, between the, the different countries. What um, um, is striking, though, is that um, Solidarność had problems with uh, <laughs> this crisis um, and saw this as a kind so and 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 now I'm I'm I, I published a chapter in in um in a volume on on this Euro missiles crisis by Leopoldo Nuti and and others um in which I examined so Solidarność attitude towards the European peace movement and they're quite negative. They're very critical of this. Um, the Polish opposition in the 1980s sees this as a kind of surrender to the Soviet Union and, and denounces the naivety of um, Western European peace militants. Um, within Belgium, you see that both trade union confederations um, side with the peace movement. Whereas um, there is difference regarding Solidarność, so the Christian Democratic Trade Union Confederation being much more solidary than, than the social democratic one. So I think that in this field too, um, yeah, uh, other interests are also at stake. And um, um, those who uh, the most vocal ones, yeah, do so are so vocal because it, it just fits into their agenda somehow. Yeah, the, uh, you mentioned the agenda, the interior, the domestic agenda. Yeah. Um, I had the impression that uh, at least for the French communist to to uh, in 1980 to side with more or, le more or less strongly to side with Solidarność was uh, uh, instrument to being accepted as part of the future uh, government uh, to to have an uh, entree billet uh, for uh, respectability uh, and being admitted into a NATO government. Um, so these tactical uh, reasonings, how important were they for other countries? I think very important, and it's quite. It seems a bit. It sounds bitter. Eh? So now, but maybe now this has a little decreased. But after 1989, this there was this this great enthusiasm of of of, um, of for Solidarność and for European unity, and everybody emphasized um, the the unconditional and overwhelming solidarity between um, or across the two blocks. But I'm afraid this this is uh, uh, this is an over overestimation, and and that indeed um, uh, many had their own reasons to be explicitly solidary or to be rather a little reluctant. Um, you give the example for CGT. Um, I think that you can do this exercise for for all of the organizations and, and all of the, the countries. This, however, does not mean that there was no genuine, that there was no sincere solidarity, that there were no emotions, that people did not um, yeah, uh, sympathize with Solidarność from the bottom of their heart. Uh, 
Um, I think we should also make the distinction between institutions and organizations on the one hand and individuals on the other. But there too, you have um, quite a lot of differences. And I also worked on, on Polish migrants and Solidarność and, and there too, you find a lot of uh, first differences. And then second, um, a, a great discrepancy between memory and reality. And so after 1989, everybody oh, yeah. emphasized it's the, the, everybody uh, uh, yeah, ended the Cold War while as a matter of fact, <laughs> only a few people did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is a general problem with uh, memory and, <laughs> yeah, and uh, most uh, try to uh, side with the right side. Uh, and so yeah. uh, I, I don't see any more questions in chat. So uh, without misusing my role as host, uh, a last question from my side. I remember that in uh, previous talks I had heard from you uh, and from uh, also from my personal uh, uh, remembrance, uh, once again, the memory, uh, that these, this, the small groups of uh, Trotskyists uh, and uh, the uh, ex or still Maoists were very active in the campaign of solidarity with Solidarność. Um, please could uh, could you please uh, elaborate a little bit on this? And uh, uh, my my uh, second half of this question was this a the, for these Trotskyists and Maoists or ex Maoists a continuation of their. Uh, previous struggle against Moscow? Um, yeah, that's another good question indeed. Um, so there were Trotskyists, um, for instance, among the Polish diaspora, um, who sided with, um, with Solidarność. And as you say, this is because, yeah, um, uh, they saw this as a, yeah, as an attack on, on Moscow, on, on Moscow dictated communism. Um, however, these groups were quite marginal. Yeah? So we're talking about few individuals. It's not the big solidarity as that we see among um, trade unions. And also this quickly led to clashes within the Polish diaspora. And um, uh, so the the Polish Solidarność activists um, in exile in Western Europe um, yeah, tried to organize themselves and were being put under the direction of the, the TKK, so the, the underground leadership of Solidarność. Um, but this then, from the summer of 1982 onwards led to a lot of tension and the Trotskyists and the Maoists by and large were the first one to be expelled from this more mainstream um, solidarity with Solidarność, which of course did not prevent them from continuing their fight, but um, this was, was no longer part of the general solidarity with Solidarność, which as such then also enabled them to emphasize their own interpretations and, and their um, points of view. So thank you very much once again, Is but uh, I don't see uh, more questions for the moment. Uh, and so, uh, it's, uh, we turn now to Christy Midema. Uh, I presented her at the beginning of our session. So Christy will speak about Polish and East German opposition and their different approaches to peace and human rights as well as to Western movements. Christy, I'm very interested uh, in hearing what, uh, what your findings were and the mic is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for the opportunity to to speak 
internationally even from my own home so that's that's lovely um and 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 then do please uh, feel free to ask the trotskist questions once more at the end because i also have opinions about that one um okay. good question interesting discussion and uh, it was also great to hear you um uh, it is about um these topics i uh, myself have looked into um western solidarity from the netherlands and west germany uh with solidarność from the uh, trade union movement, the peace movement, and uh, social democrats parties. So any questions about that are also very welcome. But I decided to um, uh, discuss a slightly different topic uh, today, a bit related though. Um, and uh, I called my, my, my short talk, Freedom or Peace, Polish and East German Oppositional Strategies in the Context of the East-West Divide. Um, and uh, Freedom and Peace is not uh, coincidentally also the name of my PhD dissertation. So it's, I think it's it's one of the main questions that both in East and West uh, organizations try to answer for themselves in the 1980s. So let's dive into the 1980s then. Um, I want to take you to two different moments. So in April 1985, there was a, a group of young people uh, that founded, largely young people that founded a new opposition group in Poland. So this is um, five years after the founding of Solidarność. It's after uh, martial law had repressed um, a lot of societal activity. Um, this group was called Wolności Pokój, Freedom and Peace. Um, about a year later, in January 1986, something happened in Berlin. Uh, there was a new group founded, a new group among the opposition that was usually working inside the church, um, and that group called itself Initiative for Freedom and Menschenrechte, the Init Initiative for Peace and Human Rights. So there are these two organizations in neighboring countries that um, both took up these topics, like peace, but also freedom, human rights, like and together. Um, I would want to like to explain today why these two groups were, were established, why at this moment, and why these topics were um, uh, united and why word order mattered. Because the opposition in both of these countries had a long tradition of working on the first issue mentioned in the name of the organization that was founded. So to remind you, in Poland, it was called Freedom and Peace. In um, East Germany, it was called the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights. They had a long tradition working on the first, but they were just discovering the second. Why were they discovering that second topic? And what was the role played by influences from abroad? That's where I want to talk about today. Um, and I first want to take you to Poland. So in Poland, I see freedom fighters discovering peace in the 1980s. Poland has a long, long history of opposition uh, by 1985. Um, there had been opposition since, to communism since the start of, of, of the regime. There had been rights-based um, opposition since the start of the Committee for the Defense of Workers in 1976. There had been the first free trade union movement in um, behind the Iron Curtain in the form of Solidarność. So by 1985, there was a lot to look back on, a lot of freedom struggle and the rights struggle, human rights struggle that people um, knew about in the opposition. But it was also a time of discovering new forms of public activism. So uh, the world had looked to, at Poland in awe during 1980, 1981. There were many forms of solidarity. Uh, well, you know everything about it since the talk of, of, of Edith Bald. Um, people um, offered solidarity from a distance, but also people were traveling to Poland around this time to be part of the experience, to deliver goods, to, to talk with people, to show active solidarity. So people started talking, even though there was this wall uh, in, 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 in Europe. Um, so this was happening on one side of the wall, right? But on the other side, there was also a lot happening in the 1980s. And we already talked a little bit about it. It was a parallel surge of activism in Western Europe, but it failed to link with what was happening in Eastern Europe. This was the time of protests against nuclear weapons. It was a time that a lot of many less left-wing activists in um, Western Europe were fearing that the events in Poland 
could upset the balance between East and West, that it could upset the, um, um, the many things that Detente had achieved uh, 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 in making the divide a bit less strong between East and West. And that fear was often bigger among some people than the wish to support activists in Poland. And that caused the reticence that we just heard about in um, the Austrian uh, trade union, in the Austrian uh, uh, Social Democratic Party, but also in the German Social Democratic Party and, um, and many other groups in, um, in, in Western Europe. So many of these left-wing organizations also were very critical of the US government, especially since Reagan took over around the same time. And this was many for many of them, or for some of them at least, the opposition towards what was happening in the US actually started to make them think that maybe actually they should have some more understanding for the Soviet Union and maybe they shouldn't judge the Soviet Union so harshly. So these um, these narratives were happening within the left wing movement. And uh, there was a lot of different discussions, but um, this um, happening at the same time, Reagan and the Euro missile, missile crisis and Solidarność create a very volatile, difficult situation in which a lot of left wing activists found it very hard to, to position themselves. It, at the same time, in Central and Eastern Europe, many activists saw these peace activists as nothing more than useful idiots of Moscow. Because why would you be against nuclear missiles if, if they were pointed at Moscow who had nuclear missiles of, them, of, them, of their own? Does that mean if you want to take those nuclear missiles away that you're okay with actually the Soviet Union having more power in Central and Eastern Europe or even in Western Europe? So this was a very difficult and heated discussion uh, that was going on at the time. Um, the feeling um, in among a lot of people in Western Europe that it was paramount to preserve the peace. Um, without peace, there is nothing. That kind of feeling, there are no human rights without peace in a lot of Central and Eastern Europe was responded to by the peace of the graveyard is not worth to be called peace. So it was clear that this mass mobilization on both sides of Europe had difficult, different opinions, but they could not ignore each other. Um, this led to public discussions printed in magazines of the Western peace movement, for example, and also of the oppositional press in countries such as Poland um, and uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, both tried to explain each other's position, position but it was difficult to get closer. Um, I however argue that there were a few important um, bridge makers between East and West. And one of them was the Polish Dutch activist Jan Minkiewicz, who uh, lived in Amsterdam, but who tried very hard to uh, both make the Polish opposition understand what was happening in Western Europe. Also the peace movement in the Netherlands was exceptionally strong. So he knew what he was talking about. And on the, on the other hand, have the peace movement understand what was happening in Poland. So one of the ways in which he tried to do that was explain the different position about peace in Poland to people in the West. And what he said is, if neighbors in the streets stop fighting, but one of the neighbors is still hitting his children, then there is no peace in the street. So why do we think, why is there a peace to preserve in Europe if Eastern Europe is internally not at peace. There was something how he tried to explain, and I would argue that he actually played a large role in um, events to come, which I'm going to, to explain. Um, because there were also a lot more open-minded activists on both sides of the wall. There were peace activists in Western Europe that kept traveling to Poland and that tried to understand what was happening and how they could connect their concept of peace which was less about preserving the current balance of power uh, and more about breaking down the power blocks in East and West from below, about making people talk to each other and creating peace, not because of a stalemate of, um, um, of missiles, but rather because the ideological divide of, uh, of Europe would come to an end. And this kind of understanding of peace would eventually meet a lot more understanding in, um, in Eastern Europe. 
So because there were these open-minded activists, um, they um, started talking to activists in Poland and made them understand that despite the misunderstandings and the disagreements that still existed between East and West, there might be actually a useful allyship here between this mass movement of hundreds of thousands on the street in, um, in Western Europe and this mass movement happening in Eastern Europe. So this is one of the reasons why Wolności Pokój, Freedom and Peace, came about in Poland. It came about after the tragedy of martial law um, at a very difficult time for Poland. At the same time, it was an outstretched hand to the peace movement, but on Polish terms. So freedom first and then peace. Um, so they they burned their draft papers, the, the activists of, of, of VIP, of Wolności Pokój, uh, but not because they were pacifists. They burned their draft papers because they didn't want to fight for this government. They didn't want to pledge allegiance to the Soviet Union. So it was a peace movement, but on the terms of, 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 of the Polish opposition. Um, they revered um, a German soldier who had refused to execute Poles in the Second World War. But at the same time, they campaigned on behalf of a Polish soldier who was fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. So um, this was a peace movement, but not a peace movement as many of the peace movements in Western Europe would look like. Nevertheless, the founding of VIP would become an important, play an important role in the starting off of a fruitful discussion and cooperation between peace movements and uh, oppositional movement in, in East and West. VIP would become an important interlocutor for the peace movement in Western Europe and would help the Western peace movement to in turn integrate human rights and a fight for freedom into their activism. Now let's move to, to East Germany, to the GDR. In the GDR, I see the opposite. I see peace activists who are discovering human rights and the topic of freedom. So in the GDR, oppositional history had taken a quite different path than in other Central and Eastern European countries. The fact that this country, this country had a parallel state sharing the same nation, but in the other ideological bloc would mean that the opposition in, 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 in East Germany had a different character. So even after fleeing from East to West would become much more difficult or even deathly, um, there were ways out one way or another um, to many people. Um, and the way out was not to just any country because Polish activists could leave the country um, not easily, but there were many that could leave the country. But for Polish activists to leave the country meant leaving their culture behind, meant leaving their language behind, leaving all of your country behind. For somebody from East Germany, fleeing the country meant finding another country with the same language, with largely the same culture, um, with similar history, at least <laughs> to a certain date, uh, with probably family and friends. The main difference was ideology. So people a lot of people who had a big problem with the ideology in the GDR would resign or flee to the Federal Republic. There was even a media space, a Western media space that, that was visible in the GDR. Like most people in the GDR could uh, one way or another watch uh, um, West German television or, or listen to radio. Um, so this means it was it was easy it was able you were able to resign it was so much different from in Poland so this meant that the people who stayed in East Germany and decided to fight um, and to be in the opposition largely were people who were interested in staying in the GDR and reforming socialism rather than toppling the regime or toppling socialism this meant they even co didn't call themselves opposition this together with the connection to a Western media sphere and a much closer affinity with uh, the left-wing milieu in, in, um, in West Germany um, meant that there were different issues that this opposition was talking about. It wasn't talking about big concepts like freedom or, or, or nationalism or, um, um, or even the trade union movement, uh, like in Poland. Um, a lot of initial discussions were about different interpretations of Marxism, or there was an opposition, an oppositional movement, an independent movement that talked about childcare. Um, 
And there was an important movement that um, talked about the militarization of society and the militarization of youth. And this group eventually merged into a peace movement around the same time that this happened in Western Europe, um, a society where there was a lot more contact with because of this shared media space as well. Um, peace was an interesting topic, partly because it was um, very much a um, propaganda topic of uh, all regimes in Central and Eastern Europe, but particularly of, of East Germany, which called itself the first um, peace, state, peace state on German soil. Um, and this meant that um, peace would be the rallying topic of uh, people who disagreed with the regime, not necessarily out of ideological reasons. They wanted socialism, but they wanted a different socialism. And one of the ways in this was very, very clear was the fact that the regime was talking about peace, but how they, they the regime talked about an armed peace. So uh, children were giving fake guns to shoot with at school. Um, so this for a lot of people was such a discrepancy that it was an easy rallying topic to, to start dissenting with the regime on. As in Poland in the mid 1980s, um, some people in the civil movement started to broaden their mind and look beyond this topic that uh, connect, connected people. In this case, they were looking actually east rather than west. Looking west had brought them the peace topic. Looking east would bring them human rights. So they were inspired by Charter 77 Czechoslovakia, inspired by Kor and Solidarność in, in Poland. Um, people in the GDR often couldn't travel west unless you fled entirely. Um, but people could until uh, at least uh, the 19, uh, 1980 in um, um, in the case of Poland, could travel um, in, uh, in Central Europe. And people also met um, these movements or heard talking about uh, what was happening in these countries. And they were inspired by many things, by the fact that these movements were working openly. They were naming names. People were openly saying or writing their names on petitions. People were um, living, as they said, like they already had the rights that they were fighting for. They were living like they already had the rights that they knew they were entitled to. And this very much inspired a group of people in the GDR who would eventually um, create the um, initiative, uh, the Initiative of Friedland Menschenrechte, the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights. Um, and they would indeed do things differently. So they were one of the first organizations that stopped publishing their publications under the name of the church, which was always a protective mechanism. Um, they, um, their publications reflected on what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe. They were reporting a lot about what was happening there. Um, but at the same time, they remain, remained very East German. They wanted to change the GDR for the better. They didn't want German unification, which is interesting because some of the Polish activists actually, even, be, even that, because though there was a fear for a strong Germany and a fear for a Germany that would reclaim its pre-war borders, there were um, Polish activists who, um, who were for German unification because they saw it as a way to freedom. That is not happening in the GDR or in lost parts of the GDR opposition at this moment. The population is large. At large, we know that it was very different and that we would see, of course, in uh, 1989. Um, I very shortly want to say something about Western peace activists. Um, we have heard from Edith Balt about uh, the response of, of, of Western activists to what's happening in, in, um, uh, in Eastern Europe, and of course also peace activists, the ones that were mobilizing on the streets in the early 1980s, they had to find out what they thought about Eastern Europe, about what was happening, about Solidarność, what was happening at the same time, the exactly same time as, um, as the mass mobilization in, in Western Europe. Um, these activists, however, themselves looked much more like the activists in the GDR, they advocated for peace. Um, many of them had a Christian and a left-wing background. Um, they were in favor of some form of socialism. Um, so that felt um, recognizable, the activists in, in East Germany, very differently so than the activists in Poland, 
So as in the GDR, some of these activists would stay in their worlds, in their safe spaces, where everybody agreed more or less on the same topics. But some of them were willing to look beyond. Um, and those who were willing to have uncomfortable discussions with people who, for example, in Poland were a fan of Reagan or were happy about the fact that the West was uh, uh, putting new, new missiles on or the fact that, um, or who believed that Western peace activists were all lackeys of Moscow. Those conversations were uncomfortable, but they also helped to create a situation in which people started to understand why people were thinking so differently elsewhere, why different circumstances, different national circumstances and different ideological circumstances created this difference. And thanks to bridge builders like Jan Minkiewicz, who I'm already mentioned, but also people like Amin Jan Faber, who was a main leader of um, the peace movement in the Netherlands, Petra Kelly, who was uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Greens in um, West Germany, Wolfgang Templin in the GDR, Constante Gebert in um, Poland. These were people who saw that um, there was an allyship beyond these obvious differences of opinion. They started to see each other as allies and opened up to each other's topics, even if that didn't mean full agreement. And one of the starting points of that opening up to each other's topics were, was the establishment of these team, two movements on very different uh, uh, grounds in Poland and the GDR. Um, as a short afterward, uh, word, what this, did this mean um, on the long run? I want to take you to uh, the Netherlands now. Um, the Netherlands were one of the main, uh, uh, well, main, <laughs> was a very important country for the, um, the mobilization of the peace movement in the 1980s. The, um, the demonstrations in 1980 and 1983 brought 300,000 and 500,000 people on the streets in Amsterdam and in The Hague, which um, I think was, well, yeah, was more than, for example, in, in Bonn, which is a country with four or five times the population. Um, so this was a massive, this was a country where, where the peace movement was massive. And one of the figureheads of that movement was Min Jan Faber, um, whom I already mentioned. Years later, in 2003, there were also peace demonstrations again on the streets of Amsterdam and The Hague, uh, this time against the war in Iraq. The scale was not comparable at all, but there were peace demonstrations and people just expected the figureheads of back then, of the 80s, like Mijan Faber to speak out. Mijan Faber, however, spoke up and uh, spoke out in, uh, in favor of the war in Iraq. The reason for that, he said, is that he thought that there were things that were more important than peace, um, that he wanted to be stand in solidarity with um, civil movements in Iraq who had indicated apparently to him that they preferred a war where they could be starting over in a democracy rather than keeping a peace that oppressed them. A lot of people didn't understand this position of Minjan Faber and there's different ways that you can talk about it and we can discuss a long time on whether he was right. But one thing I think is for sure, only those who tracked the journeys of the topics of freedom and peace in the Cold War can understand where these positions way after the Cold War came from. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Chrissy, for this uh, stimulating talk. And uh, once again, if you have questions uh, for Christy, please write it in the chat or write in the chat that you have a question and uh, then uh, you can, uh, I think, directly put it, uh, switch on your mic and put the question only to, that I have an overview. But uh, uh, at the moment, I don't see questions. So my first question is, uh, taking up uh, the the last idea you uh, put forward in in, in your talk, um, uh, uh, telling the story of this Dutch Polish activist uh, who, uh, as I if I uh, rightly understood, um, acted uh, as some kind of bridge builder between East and Western uh, movements, uh, peace movements, freedom movements in the eighties. And in 2003, uh, was in favor of the Iraq intervention. Um, uh, could, could 
uh, I, I have uh, hearing this. I have the idea that um, um, uh, the the solidarity, move, solidarity movements of the 1980s, uh, solidarity from Western Europe to uh, uh, to Eastern European uh, dissidents, protest movements, which finally led to the fall of the wall, uh, which were victorious, uh, you could say. Uh, had as a negative side that they misled us to believe in um, re re regime change as a, uh, as a uh, pattern that could be uh, transferred to other regions. Uh, and we all know, I, I think we agree, perhaps we don't, but I think we would, should agree that uh, the Iraq re regime change uh, in 2003 uh, ended in a disaster. So uh, was this the, the uh, reversal side of the coin uh, of this uh, positive experience of the 1980s that uh, from different, uh, different forces joining and uh, succeeding uh, finally with the help of Michael Gorbachev also and so on, toppling uh, communism and so we could uh, uh, go on in, in the rest of the world. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I, I, of course, brought this on myself by bringing such a, <laughs> by, by bridging uh, something more to the, um, to the present, although actually 2003 is a long time ago. Um, yeah, the, first of all, to, to, um, to clarify, uh, these are two different people, by the way, the bridge oh, builder, okay, yeah. Kiewicz, who was Dutch Polish, and uh, Minjan Faber, who is one of the uh, most um, famous Dutch uh, peace activists. Um, but the question still stands, it's indeed, it's the same. Um, it might indeed, well, I think in the case, in case of Mitjan Faber, it's really clear that he was very much influenced by um, his conversations with activists in Eastern Europe during uh, the Cold War, but maybe also in the years after uh, there was this civic um, um, initiative where, where uh, civic movements all across Europe um, exchanged uh, experiences and information over all these years. And I think there was a learning process going on. And that learning process was, um, there is more than just peace. Peace um, can be oppressive. And if peace is oppressive, um, it might be more important to risk uh, uh, losing that peace, but then in the same process, liberating peoples. I think that is um, a, a learning process uh, that took place in, in, in certain people that um, that had these discussions over the years. Um, but of course, there is a major difference between um, uh, a transition from an unfree regime to a democracy that is happening from inside out than one that is created from the outside. And um, I think transition processes are never easy. Um, nowhere. I'm, I'm also, I'm yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in Belarus um, if um, uh, if Lukashenko would fall there. Um, th those processes are never easy. But I think that there is a stronger basis, of course, if an organization largely uh, 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 self-mobilized as part of that process. Are there situations in which regime change forced from outside could work? I don't know. We, I think we're very clear that in Iraq, it was a disaster. I, um, could it work in the long run? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is very clear that um, um, this euphoria about a lot of regimes toppling shortly after each other might have created in within some people the feeling that uh, toppling a regime and building up a new society is easy. And it isn't. It isn't anywhere, unfortunately. And um, that doesn't mean that uh, authoritarian regimes should be supported because of peace, because they shouldn't. But it also means that um, there is no easy answer uh, between peace and human rights, nowhere. There's a question from Pedro Pinella. Yeah. Do you agree that, he asked you, or perhaps you see it in the chat, do you agree that sometimes there are more important things than peace? Um, 
that is indeed something that is very, very clear among these discussions. They, um, the necessity of activists in Central and Eastern Europe to explain to people who have, um, who have connected themselves entirely to the topic of peace, um, to explain to them there is more than just peace. There is peace of a graveyard. There is peace indeed in a street where children are still being hit. Peace doesn't mean that people are happy or free or can actually live in peace. So that whole idea between peace between countries and peace inside countries, I think um, uh, is a very good explanation of why just sticking to the idea of peace and peaceful relations between states can actually be massively oppressive. Um, indeed, I myself also personally, while doing this, this research, um, have learned a lot from this. And um, um, I found it very interesting that indeed, um, well, a small anecdote is that um, several of my articles have been, um, have been translated into Polish and in um, uh, anyway, there is on the one hand, there is a relatively negative feeling about uh, the, the, the peace movement in, among certain groups in Poland, something which Edith Balt already explained. And what I noticed is that um, the peace movement was always translated as pacifist movement in um, um, articles in Polish. And I always went back to the translators and said, no, you have to translate it as um, peace movement. And um, the reason of that is, is that there were activists who said we are peace activists, but we're not pacifists. Mm. We understand that there are things that are more can be more important than peace, and that in some instances, violence might be needed to achieve something, or violence can be avoided. We are for peace, but we are for peace as a general concept, as indeed internal peace and external peace. And I think that's difference between peace as an as a holistic concept and pacifism, uh, the avoidance of all violence at all costs, I think is, is one thing that I have learned and I was inspired by while doing this research. Yeah, a large parts of the West German peace movement uh, were at the same time active in solidarity with Central American liberation movements. So they uh, definitely uh, did, uh, were not uh, pacifists. That brings me to another question, which is which goes to both of you. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher sided strongly with Solidarność. At the same time, they were crushing the uh, at home the, the trade unions. Uh, and uh, how, how important was uh, this uh, this issue in the discussion uh, in, 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 uh, within Solidarity, Solidarność, and also within the uh, uh, groups of Solidarity with Solidarność? that uh, you're on the same side as uh, these uh, fierce opponents of uh, free trade unions, unions in their own uh, countries. For me, it was at this, at this time a very big problem. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, um, there's, there's two sides, maybe maybe it is what you wanna also talk about the, uh, the Polish side. Um, although indeed a lot of Polish activists were generally just happy with anyone who actively wanted to speak out uh, on their behalf, which of course a lot of the more left-wing social democrats or even trade union activists in, um, in, in Western Europe were less prepared to do than people like Reagan and Thatcher. But in the left-wing movement, you see indeed there is a lot of awkwardness around this fact that Solidarność is being supported by these, well, the, uh, their nemesis actually at this moment there is there is nothing worse at this moment than reagan and thatcher um and this adds to all of the other awkwardness that already exists around around uh, solidarność so there is already this feeling as i said in the beginning that solidarność might be um hurting the talent or might actually be be risking the peace there is this um awkwardness about the the massive amount of catholicism within solidarność there is um this feeling among certain activists whether can you actually be against this movement that is challenging the soviet union because if you have to choose between the soviet union and the us under reagan then 
at least the social gene is the less bad option. There are so many different levels of this awkwardness that are going on that indeed Reagan and, and Thatcher is one of them and is a massive one of them. And is a reason that a lot of, uh, uh, um, a lot of, of uh, left-wing activists, uh, yeah, are, are almost scared to support Solidarność or if they do so, they will only justify it by naming um, right-wing atrocities in the same breath. So they will say in one sentence, we oppose what is happening in Poland. The, we oppose martial law in Poland as we oppose the right-wing coup in Turkey. Or we oppose what's happening in Poland at the same time as what is happening in, in El Salvador. So um, they, they totally, they all the time need to justify themselves. And Reagan and, and, and Thatcher are an, an important part of that. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, with what Christy says uh, um, regarding um, uh, the 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 Western Bloc. Um, yeah, awkwardness. But at the same time, I I also see that they continued supporting um, Solidarność and and the Poles, so in spite of of Reagan and Thatcher, but in a less vocal way. Yeah? So they did not explicitly um side with with or yeah side with solidarność um there's also the the fact that in the 1970s um many transnational social movements were rather left-wing so um sympathizing with um with vietnam or um against pinochet and in the early 1980s um some trade unions, such as, such as, for instance, in Belgium, the Christian Democrats, um, kind of yeah, caught up with with the the left wing um, social solidarity or transnational solidarity from the 1970s. So that's for the West, um, for Poland itself. Um, the support or of Thatcher or um, uh, Reagan was far less problematic. Um, of course, they knew about uh, what uh, Reagan and Thatcher were doing um, at home, but they saw their situation um, first and foremost in terms of the Cold War and not of um, yeah, uh, social democracy and, and, and trade union activism. Uh, Solidarność was a trade union, but this was actually to, yeah, to weaken the communist system at, at, at its core. Yeah? Uh, the communists uh, representing, uh, defending uh, laborers, but now being uh, uh, countered by laborers, uh, by blue collar workers, by trade unions um, itself. So, um, yeah, you see this this sympathy with uh, Reagan and, and 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 Thatcher, but especially with Reagan in, in other fields as well. I, I um, answered you, Bernd, about uh, peace activism. So solidarity versus. Um, the peace movements in, in the West, well, there too, they, they, um, they yeah, preferred to the Euro missiles um, to, to, to peace and, and, and what Christy says so about Western um, left wing um, yeah, preferring the Soviet Union than, than Reagan's anti-unionist um, fight. Well, the Poles would call this blunt naivety, and and yeah, got 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 angry about this. Uh, so they couldn't understand why people in the West would um, sympathize with the Soviet Union. They saw this as uh, the result of successful propaganda and then denounced the double standards of the left 
um, so th this was this there was such an, an ideological uh, fight going on, especially in in Polish periodicals. Yeah, I, I think that um, that vis-a-vis -vis the West themselves, Poles were more diplomat and, and they didn't want to um, to to break all bridges. But but in 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 those diaspora Polish diaspora periodicals, there's yeah, real anger and indignance and, and frustration about um, Western sympathy with, um, with the Soviet Union. And that is also, interestingly, I think the um, uh, Yaminkiewicz, who I talked about as a, as a bridge builder, um, so he was from Polish background, he lived in the Netherlands, he, he saw the peace movement there, he saw the, the potential for this movement to support the, 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 po the Polish movement. So the first time that, indeed, as I said, Min Jan Faber and other main leaders of this movement went to Poland, he, he sent, like through underground press, he sent, sent a note to Lech Wałęsa, uh, writing in Polish saying, in, like, speak to these people. They aren't the useful idiots that you think they are. Like if you if you if you get through that, these are people you can actually you can trust and you can work with. But indeed, the um, the mutual perception was so difficult, and it was very difficult to overcome this. But I think there were some crucial people who have really um, broke. Yeah, have, have have done a great job to break through this um, these walls that existed. And I, I don't know if I can say anything about trot, Trotskyists at this moment. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, because I think you one believe. of the reasons I also study the um, 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 the, the Greens in uh, uh, sort of the Green Party in, in, in West Germany. And a lot of those, uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of people who were in the Green Party were also in, uh, in so called Kagruppen. So the smaller communist, but also Maoist, Trotskyist groups, or who used to be in these groups. And you can really very clearly see that those who have a Trotskyist or a Maoist background, they, for them, it's much more, it's much easier and much more natural to support Solidarność. And I think the reason for that is they already had their struggle with these difficult topics of how can I be against the Soviet Union and still be a left-wing person? They had gone through that struggle so like already for such a long time ago, for them, it was just very, very natural to support workers where they could. And they didn't have any remaining loyalties or a fear that somebody from the outside might say, oh, you're now on Reagan's side and you are, you are fighting against the Soviet Union, you are bad. They were radical, radical left wings. They had their self understanding as radical left wing. Other people saw them as radical left wing. People couldn't, um, couldn't accuse them of being in the same boat with Reagan. Whereas uh, a respectable social Democrat who was much more to the center, if they would say I am, if, if they would be seen as being in the same boat with Reagan or in Germany, Strauss, mm -hmm. let's not forget that. There is, there is similar examples there of people you just don't want to be associated with. If you're much more to the center left, um, you didn't have it's it's much more difficult whereas these trotskists they had had their ideological struggle they knew where they stood and they could just easily support this that would be my assessment for at least for germany hmm. the trotskists and maoists bring me uh, to another question uh, perhaps you know that the german trotskists and maoists uh, uh, since the beginnings trotskists in the 50s and maoists in the early 70s were uh, opposed to the rest of the West German left, uh, were in favor of a unified, of course, socialist, but a unified Germany. Whereas uh, great parts of the West German left saw the uh, German division as uh, the result of uh, Nazi terror of uh, the Shoah, and that should be that should last uh, for centuries. So uh, and. Uh, Parts of the Polish uh, diaspora and the Polish dissidents uh, were outspoken in the mid, early in the mid, mid uh, 1980s uh, that uh, the uh, division of Germany could not last forever. That as Poland, uh, uh, like Poland, had uh, struggled for over 100 years for 
national and, and unified national state. Uh, also, Germany uh, should, and not only in 100 years, but earlier, should be reunified. This was uh, shocking, provocative for the great uh, big majority of the West German left, but uh, uh, the Maoists and Trotskyists uh, could easily join this. But uh, how was it uh, this, this uh, uh, how representative was this position uh, for uh, to, to be uh, in favor of uh, German uh, unification? How representative was it for the Polish opposition movement? I remember it, it was a special number of Kultura in 1985, Kultura, the exile uh, journal published in Paris uh, for, for, uh, by uh, Polish dissidents. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think I think actually the the, the Trotskis and the uh, and a, a part of the of the Polish well oppositional intelligentsia um, both saw, thought that a Germany should be united. I don't think they agreed on the ideology that should be done under. By the way, yeah. Jacek <laughs> Kuron. Um, uh, hmm. Kuron. Jacek Kuron. I don't know if, if Kuron, yeah, Kuron he's, was he's called a Trotskis. He was called a Trotskis. Yeah, I don't know if he was in favor of German reunion. Re reunification I, I i must admit i know it's more the centrist circles um mm. um the uh the catholic circles of of the intelligentsia for Kuron, I, I would have to look it up i i don't know uh, from the top of my head but yeah um generally uh, i think a lot of it was i i would say it was a minority um um intelligentsia position uh it was a um a position a rational position um well yeah just from the from the realization that um the gdr was a lock on central and eastern europe it was um an ideological lock in many ways it was one of the strictest countries of the bloc um so reunification under um a liberal if you will capitalist or at least liberal democratic uh, um um government would mean that um that lock would be broken and that the way towards more freedom in central and eastern europe would also be open it what was very very clear that they were in favor of reunification by the way with the new border right and not the pre-war border and that was something which for example christian democrats often often failed to hear when they heard that polish activists were in favor of reunification they were happy to just hear that and they just didn't listen to the whole story about the odonaisa uh, border but i would say that it's it was um, a difficult position in many ways because together with um the realization of the head that freedom and reunification for Germany could um, be a way to create more freedom for Poland. Uh, there was the feeling of the, of the belly, of um, the fear of a big Germany and uh, the memories of uh, the war, but even in it more recently, what would happen if there would be a reunified Germany? What would happen to that border indeed? And would they reclaim the former German lands? So, and I would say, if you would probably look in the general population, uh, the feeling of, uh, or just a bad uh, um, um, idea about a big, a big, strong, reunified Germany would be stronger than this more intellectual position of a reunified Germany as, um, as a, um, a bridge to freedom. Yeah, it is better. Yeah, uh, thank you, Christy. Uh, two points that I just would, would like to add. Um, um, first, um, regarding Trotskyists and, and, and the, or the Polish opposition. Uh, so it is true that this was very diverse. Um, Solidarność and more precisely the, the intellectuals supporting Solidarność. Uh, and there were left wingers and and right wingers um, all at the same time. Actually, you see how all, you, you, this is also visible in the legacy of Solidarność after 1989 and, and the way how this this dispersed into different political parties and and now even even uh, uh, well, uh, opposite um, uh, groups. However. Um, 
I think that in the 1980s, the, um, the homogeneity was more important than the, um, the heterogeneity. Um, you mentioned Kuron, um, another very important um, left-wing uh, Polish dissident is Adam Michnik. And he, in 1976, wrote um, a key monograph in which he called um, the Poles to, to, or the Polish opposition to, to unite, to, in which he called for a dialogue between the left and the church. And, um, and this actually opened the doors to first um, uh, Kor, and so an opposition movement in 1976, and, and then uh, eventually to Solidarność in 1980. Before 1976, so before Adam Michnik wrote that book, um, there had been opposition, but intellectuals, um, the church, and blue collar workers all did this independently from each other. And so the, the Polish workers in 1956 and 1970, um, the church in 1966, for instance, for the millennium, and intellectuals, for instance, in 1968, but they did so independently from each other. And after 1976, also due to Helsinki and so on and so forth, they were united. Um, all of this also being backed by John Paul II, which also kind of, of further fueled Polish nationalism. So there was division, of course, but the, the unity of thoughts and, of, of, and, and the, the national struggle against communism was way more important. So that's my first point. My second point is regarding Germany. Um, yet the Poles closely followed um, things, of course, although they wouldn't expect Germany to be united already that early as it eventually happened. Um, they also had um, um, other ideas in, in terms of, of, of geopolitics and, and the 1980s is also the rise of Central Europe, the idea of Central Europe. And um, so Michnik, for instance, was one of the key poles in the meetings and in the um, conception of, of Central Europe with uh, Milan Kundera and, and Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia and Georgi Konrad in, in, in Hungary. Um, so, yeah, what, what would later become the Visegrad uh, group. So this was another way of dealing with um, um, with a, um, a potential united Germany, although I don't think that, that they, at that time, were inspired by a possible unification. It, it was more to, to identify themselves as, as that part of Europe that, um, yeah, um, found itself uh, at the eastern side of the Iron Curtain, but historically speaking, in, in their eyes, uh, had always belonged to, to Europe. Um, I, I would like to uh, switch to another uh, issue. Um, a large parts of the, at least the German left, or maybe the entire West European left, much, uh, large parts, uh, well, look with some interest uh, towards Poland, but we're more uh, more interested in Central America. Uh, Nicaragua, 1979, the Sandinistas uh, toppled down the Somoza dictatorship, uh, and in 1980, the civil war in El Salvador started with uh, a Christian democratic government fighting against uh, social democratic sponsored guerrilla. Uh, very rare situation, but uh, was Central America for any part of the Polish and East German uh, opposition movement uh, an issue of interest? Should I go first? Yeah. Christy? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, indeed. Solidarność tried to internationalize its, its case. And um, it is interesting. Um, so next to, let's call it Central America, so Nicaragua in, in the first place, but also El Salvador, um, there was also Chile yeah, with, with mm. Pinochet, which still, uh, in spite of, of, of yeah, dating already from 1973, still remained an, an, an issue and, and all over the 1980s until the fall of Pinochet. And then third, there was uh, apartheid, South Africa, uh, or anti-apartheid, the, the Western um, fight or against uh, apartheid, which I think was even um, greater than um sympathy with latin america or solidarity with uh with solidarność yeah, if the Netherlands and germany was a little bit different yeah if the largest transnational social movement of the 1980s was the anti-apartheid movement yeah, yeah. yeah now how did solidarność relate to these movements it this is interesting it was um uh it allied most with chile and it allied less, it identified less with Nicaragua. And this is interesting because Nicaragua was also a left-wing, even dark spectacled general <laughs> uh, leading a country and an opposition being supported by Ronald Reagan uh, and, and so on. While Chile was the opposite. There you had the right-wing dictator being opposed by um, left-wing exiles and, and, and so on. Now, Solidarność identified way more with Chile than with Nicaragua. Uh, and this is because it could in this way show that it was um, a universal cause, that it was not a puppet of Reagan. Um, that it um, yeah, was, was um, um, fighting for justice. And in this way also, yeah, try to, to, to get credits with um, uh, the left wing in, in, in Western Europe. Regarding anti-apartheid, it was quite silent. Um, unlike what's happened afterwards in, in the 1990s. So in the 1990s, Solidar Solidarność um, often put itself in the same, within the same brackets as, as, as anti-apartheid, while as a matter of fact, in the 1980s, there were little, there was, there were little connections. And if there were connections, they were made by the West. For instance, Favenza first, and then Desmond Tutu um, receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but Solidarność itself did not really identify, and this is um, because of um, particular reasons, um, namely uh, Polish refugees in Austrian and German camps were hired by the South African authorities to work in South Africa. And this upset the black opposition in South Africa, because in this way, they actually, these Poles supported the um, apartheid regime. They led to new immigration to South Africa, white immigration. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, another reason is that the ANC in Polish eyes was communist. It, it, it itself defined it as uh, indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. They emphasized the, the communist uh, um, CPSA, the Communist Party of South Africa, was the most prominent. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. But they and see, and so, so I mean, the black opposition was more than only communist. But mm. the for, for the Poles, uh, they they saw this as a communist threat, mm. and they actually were afraid that if the apartheid regime fell, things in South Africa would develop in the ways they, the, of, they had, that, that happened in, 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 in 
uh, other Southern African countries after the decolonization of, of, of the Portuguese colonies, so Angola, Mozambique, and, and so on. So they kept their hands off uh, South Africa, identified first and foremost with the, uh, the fight against Pinochet, and were also quite silent about Nicaragua and El Salvador. And to add to that, I think it's really interesting if you look at the movements um, in the mid 80s. So at the moment that um, that Solidarność is well, it's still active, but it's partly underground. And um, there are other uh, above ground movements in Poland um, who, as I said, as partly as, as Wolny Szybok, we start talking to the Western peace movement that sometimes also co-signing the Western peace, peace movement statements on, on certain countries. Um, it's just a way to to um, to create trust and to show we're now we're now allies we're now on the same side and you see so that's if some pol uh, prominent Polish um, activists then co-sign certain certain statements of uh, uh, of the Western peace movement and at the same time get a lot of criticism on that internally still about why are you supporting mm. these um, uh, uh, these statements, what would happen? Like, isn't that, isn't it then uh, a communist um, uh, opposition movement that that uh, uh, if what well, what happens if they if they take over power, etc. So you see that these discussions are going on, and as a reflection on on what Edith Spalt said, I think it's really interesting to see that indeed that uh, needs to balance. As I said, in in Western Europe, it was very common to say oh. I support. Um, workers in Poland, but I also support uh, uh, workers in Turkey or even more in Turkey or in uh, in wherever in the world uh, where there's a right wing regime um, that that uh, uh, needs apparently was also um, uh, existence within uh, the Polish opposition or within Solidarność that they had to move within that international uh, uh, environment of, of balancing and um, as, as was mentioned in the beginning, my, my, my second uh, book was about um, Amnesty International, which I argue is very much a child of the Cold War. And you see that within Amnesty International, they only let that go uh, um, a few years ago. There was always the um, understanding that groups who were active within Amnesty International needed to be active on one prisoner in Eastern Europe, one prisoner mm. in uh, the West and one prisoner that was in an unaligned country. And I think that, that very, very uh, um, strict and, and cramped form of balancing, um, you see that everywhere uh, uh, in, in social movements in the 70s and 80s. And well, if you see within MSD, even within the 60s already, um, which I, I think is very interesting to study and to, uh, to analyze, but also I think was very stifling for a lot of people because you just couldn't say anything about any country without also mentioning another. So my last question, the project uh, of which tonight's event is part of, is called No Wall. How important was Solidarność for the fall of the wall? You want to go first, Edith Belt, or should I? <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Time to reflect. <laughs> yes, this is a very, very difficult question, I always find. And yeah. um, what I, um, um, the story from Poland is very clear. Uh, I remember uh, walking around uh, uh, around the celebration of the fall of the, of the German wall in 2009, where there was this massive poster on the uh, on Central Station in Berlin saying it all started in Poland. Yeah. <laughs> so just don't forget. Um, I think indeed that is one thing, of course, the feeling that um, eventually all the other countries um, got the limelight, right? There was, there was, it was much more photogenic what was happening in, in, in East Germany or even in a much more, uh, uh, well, um, macabre way in, in Romania than the peaceful transition in, in Poland and the feeling that uh, the crumbling of this, um, um, of this regime had been going on for, for 10 years and even longer and then all those other countries do it in a few days. I think that, of course, was very frustrating to see from from a country where where indeed this this opposition had been so massive. Um, I find it very difficult to uh, to pinpoint what exactly 
there was so many factors that were going on. But what I always find very important, I always stress in everything that is that I'm writing about 1989 and uh, uh, that I'm discussing about about uh, the fall of the wall, is that um, you can't explain, you can't talk about what happened in Eastern Europe 1989 and the years after without talking about the opposition movements and the people that have um, that have created their that movements that have opposed that have shown uh, the, a strong voice of a large part of the people um, you can't um, explain what happened from structural elements alone you can't only uh, uh, point towards economy you can't only point towards Reagan you can't there is this massive internal movement that happened that showed uh, 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 um, a potential for change a will to change and um, and I think that showed lo loudest um, if not earliest but at least loudest in, in Poland and Solidarność was a very, very important um, um, actor in that. So um, I am hesitant to say what exactly they meant uh, among all the different actors. I'm not going to give it a percentage, but I, I do say it mustn't be disregarded and it was very, very crucial. It is bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with with Christy. It's a very complicated um, um, question, or but no, it's a simple question, but the answer is very complicated. <laughs> as, a, as a question, it's simple. Uh, the answer is difficult. Indeed. Um, yeah, there's so many elements that that played a role. I agree with uh, what Christy says about the importance of of the people. Um, there's also the, the the, the problems of the system and of the, the, the communist economy was already bankrupt or mm. was heading for bankruptcy in the early 1980s. And, um, and for instance, uh, Jaruzelski, um, after 1989, uh, always said that, that he opted for the, the less evil by issuing martial law. Mm. Because in this way, he prevented an intervention of, of the Soviet um of the soviet union in in poland which would yeah. lead to which would have led to a bloodbath now this is not true Jaruzelski, yeah. as a matter of fact regularly asked brezhnev to intervene and brezhnev yeah. wasn't um, um able to do so because he already saw that 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 but he that um economy was failing um, and, and the empty shops in the 1980s, both in the Soviet Union and in Poland and in other countries, are as an explanation as important as, as the people. Having said this, look at what China did in the 1980s. Mm. So this, the Eastern Bloc could also have transformed communism in a different way and, and kept power. Um, I think Gorbachev is, is also a, a key... Um, uh, player, yeah. as is John Paul II, uh, maybe especially because what he did not, or or he prevented the Poles from um, rising against the Russians, from keeping them uh, um, calm. Uh, two days ago, George Shultz died, mm. uh, Reagan's Secretary of State, and and he actually. Yeah, is also important because he accounts partly accounts for the dramatic shift that Reagan made in the 1980s. Yeah. So initially, the, he called the empire of evil, sorry, the Soviet Union empire of evil, and and then uh, after 1985, he he set up negotiations with, with Gorbachev. That's another um, yeah major turn. So, so you see, so many people played a role in, in, in this. I'm talking about politicians. Christy did about um, uh, the people. I think there's so many aspects. And um, yeah, uh, you should, certainly cannot credit one um, 
particular actor or, or one group or one uh, explanation. Um, it's it's yeah, uh, just a combination of, of, of many things. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we still have time, 10 minutes technically, uh, for last questions. But I can understand that after one minute, one hour and 50 minutes, headaches are starting. <laughs> so I thank you all. Uh, the remaining 28 participants for staying on board. Uh, but uh, la last but not least, uh, Christian Edesbald for this very stimulating talks. And uh, it gave me, and I hope so for you, same uh, stuff to think about. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, questions I could have raised uh, Additionally, but uh, time is uh, limited and concentration is limited, uh, and even the day is limited. In 24 hours, it's over after 24 hours. And uh, so at 21 hours Berlin time, 20 hours Lisbon time, or 10 minutes before, I would thank you very, very much and uh, say goodbye. Wish you. Uh, uh, Good rest of the night. And Felix, uh, is there anything to announce or to to uh, explain next activities of No Wall? In two weeks, uh, we will have another session of No Wall. So I invite everyone to participate. Um, I'm sure that uh, we'll be as good as this one. Thank you so much for all this, the speakers and for you, Bern, for this excellent session. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, stay safe and sane. <laughs>